Hi everyone, welcome to today's Zora Innovators webinar featuring MuleSoft. Uh, the purpose of this series is to highlight innovative businesses, um, and in this case, subscription businesses, because those are today's most innovative in the market. Uh, and today's featured guest is, is MuleSoft, which is really productizing integration in the cloud. And MuleSoft is a customer and partner of Zora's. So just to quickly meet today's panel, I'm your host, Sam Peterson. Uh, with me is Madhikar Kumar from Zora Services, and our featured guest is Chris Prapura from MuleSoft. Chris has 19 years' experience in the tech industry bringing new products to market, and today he's the GM of MuleSoft's recently launched cloud integration platform as a service called ION. Welcome, Jen. Thank you. All right. So we're basically going to cover three things today, and this is MuleSoft's innovation story. The first piece is um, how they're innovating from a business model standpoint. The second piece is how they're innovating from a technology standpoint. And the third piece is what they are doing from a pricing and packaging standpoint that's helping push them ahead in the market. And then at the end, we're going to cover your questions. Um, if on the right-hand side of your screen, you can see a chat function. You can ask your questions at any time. If something's pertinent to what we're talking about, we will, um, we will jump in and, um, and interrupt the presentation and ask a question or we'll save the questions for the end and, and cover hopefully all of them. Uh, so with that, let's get started. Um, Chris, why don't you dive into uh, the first piece of this, which is uh, the business model innovation that you're doing. Sure, thanks Thanks for having me. So uh, MuleSoft's been around for about eight, coming up on eight years. Um, and we today offer uh, operate three different lines of business. Um, we started actually not even as a company, we started as an open source project called Mule. And Mule is an integration middleware uh, piece of technology. It's, uh, it's open sourced um, and has really uh, been very, very widely adopted around the world. Um, we've had a, a couple million downloads of the open source version. There's uh, 3,000 and counting big enterprise customers that run us in production today. Um, we have a developer community of over 100,000 uh, developers that, that use Mule to integrate uh, systems within the enterprise. Um, that business then evolved and it started out with a services business around the open source and evolved into a commercial product. We have an enterprise version of the product that sells on an annual subscription. And that then we built a company around and, and got funded and, and became a traditional startup. Uh, and, and that business is, has done very well. We still operate that, that business. It's the lion's share of our business. Um, and it looks like an enterprise software business uh, with annual subscriptions. Uh, let's see, early this year we started an effort to actually move into our third uh, business model, which is a cloud business. Uh, and uh, in August we launched ION, which is um, uh, an integration platform as a service, which is a category that Gartner Group uh, tracks. Uh, we launched that in August, and um, and that business has just exploded. We're over a thousand customers on the platform now. Um, I think we've processed now over 600,000 transactions, uh, and we have developers coming to the community all the time, uh, wanting to move integration into the cloud. So, so we've kind of been innovating our business model from the very beginning. It's it's part of the company's culture, and today we operate these really three lines of business. Um, in terms of technology innovation, you know, the, the recent innovation that we've moved to is, is, is really centered around the cloud. And, and what's happening in the cloud, you know, it took sort of 10 years in, inside the enterprise for SOA or service-oriented architecture to try and gain traction. Some might argue it's taken 15 years going back to standards from the mid-90s. Um, and that, that's been a very, very slow process. In the cloud, it's completely different. Um, Everything has a public API. If you don't have a public API, you really aren't participating in the economy of the cloud. And if you look at uh, these stats, these are from Programmable Web, which tracks public APIs. You know, we've just seen an absolute explosion of APIs. Up uh, these again, public APIs. You know, in the early days, it was it was uh, things like media outlets that would publish their API for content to be published and, and, and others to subscribe to. But now you've really seen, it, particularly last year and this year, you've seen traditional brick and mortar companies start to offer a public API. If you want to tap into Walmart, uh, into their supply chain, there's an API for that. If you want to participate in the Amazon marketplace, there's APIs for that. If you want to do business with 
uh, Best Buy or um, Home Depot, they have APIs for that. So things have really, really exploded. So, so step number one in, in the cloud has been everything has to have an API. Um, the second step in the cloud, uh, cloud 201 I call it, is everything as a service. So you know, why publish an API? Uh, it's because you want people to be able to transact with you over the web. So most of us are familiar with these brands from the web browser and from a user interface. You know, we, we log on to Facebook and use it as, as human beings. Um, many of us use Salesforce.com for our CRM. But I think probably the most telling statistic in, in this slide, is, for me anyway, is that back in March of 2008, Salesforce.com hit a milestone. More than half of the traffic on the Salesforce cloud was going through the API. And what that means is they had more transactions going on between applications, talk, from applications talking to Salesforce's platform than they did users using the GUI, using the graphical interface. Uh, and so really this has been, a, I'd say in the last two years, there's a real tipping point over to machine-to-machine -machine integration where applications need to talk to each other in a more automated way. Uh, and you've seen that, you know, you see, you couple that with the explosion of SaaS applications in general. Every, everybody's moving their applications to a SaaS type model. And if you go to the next slide, you know, the, the next problem that, that jumps up is, you know, how do I deal with the integration itself? So uh, what many people are doing is hand coding integration or hand coding extensions, but that means hiring developers, having developers on staff, and these integrations oftentimes are not core to what you're doing in your business. Um, and this is a recent survey published by Think Strategies where it looked at what are the biggest pain points that people are having with SaaS in general and you know, it, it, you know, security always seems to jump to the top of the list, of course, but right behind it is, is integration. How, how do I standardize that integration? Uh, you know, w one other thing I'd point out, it's a little ways down here, but, but uh, right in the middle of the chart, you'll see pricing. And, and because that's another one of the themes of this talk, you know, uh, pricing uh, definitely is a competitive advantage. It, it, people struggle with SaaS pricing if it's not clear and transparent. And so as you're putting whatever your service is out there for people to subscribe to, you need to be able to do it in a, in a flexible way so that you can cater to different audiences, create different packages, create different pricing plans. Um, it really is kind of, in my mind, table stakes if you're going to do business uh, on the web and in the cloud. So what's our solution around these APIs and services and, and this issue? Um, uh, we, we launched essentially this platform service called Meal Ion. Um, and Ion, rather than get into all the technical um, capabilities of it, uh, not knowing what the audience is here, um, it, there are a number of things that applications need to do to talk to each other. Um, there's obviously the security and authentication, being able to authenticate you know, one system into another and talk in a trusted manner. Um, most applications on the web are transactional and they need to operate in real time. They're very event driven, a user clicking on a shopping cart on a, or a checkout button on their shopping cart. It, it's a very transactional kind, kind of world and so there's a lot of technical capabilities that your infrastructure software needs to have to be able to participate in those transactions. Um, and then by the nature of the web, being very loosely coupled where you have systems that operate independent of each other, you need to be able to have that, the flexibility in the architecture to, um, to, to deal with the latencies and things that, ha that are inherent in the web. So asynchronous type operations where you can, a system that the whole browser doesn't hang and wait for three or four systems to finish their processing before the user gets back uh, a confirmation, for example, that their order went through. So there's a lot of flexibility needed in the system that we've built into ION. Um, if you go to the next slide, the other key piece that we've, um, we've, we've built out of the box, and, and this is something we've brought forward from our open source developer community, is what we call cloud connectors. Um, we have over 100 cloud connectors that go out of the box, um, so it's very easy to bring these into ION uh, and, and talk to all these APIs. So these are essentially standardized wrappers around all those public APIs that allow you to quickly build integrations 
uh, in the ion environment. Um, we obviously have one for Zora, you see there at the bottom. Um, we've, we've all sorts of interesting applications that have been built with these. Uh, we've, uh, we've got a nice integration with Twilio. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with Twilio. It's a voice enablement and, and SMS uh, texting through an API. So you can put, um, you know, you can dial in a phone number. Um, you can actually speak to it and ask, what's my Zora balance on my, on my subscriptions? And the Twilio uh, API will call Zora through ION and return back uh, the, the customer balance. So you can do some very uh, innovative sort of speech recognition IVR type of things by just putting Twilio in front of any one of these business APIs and now you can speak to the API and get back you know, your customer information. So there's all sorts of interesting possibilities that can now happen. Um, so in addition to sort of the core platform and the connectors, we, you know, what do you build with these things? So you've got this platform that has capabilities, you have these connectors. Um, we have, and this gets to the pricing uh, innovation a little bit later, but we've created um, something called iApps. So these are integration applications. Um, they are small little app applications that live outside of, let's say, your Zora environment or outside of your Salesforce environment. And what they do is they actually are business logic that, that um, operates a business function that sits in between uh, two systems. So classic examples would be uh, commerce to cash. So you have a commerce system, it generates orders, now what? Okay, those orders need to go into your pricing catalog, they clear your inventory system. Uh, how, does that, how do those web orders get into your, into your other systems? How does, um, when somebody fills out a customer form on the e-commerce site, do you want them to do you want to create then a customer record in your Salesforce system? Um, once they buy something, you now want to create a customer record in your invoice system. Today, a lot of that is very manual with humans in the loop. Um, and what we've do, done is prepackaged very common integration scenarios into these things called IAPs. Um, and, and just to give you an example, this is, this is actually from our own website. Um, so you start in the upper left with ION, you create your account. Um, I don't show it on here, but the minute you create your account, it actually populates both our Marketo and Salesforce um, system. So now you, you're a, a lead because, um, as I'll talk about, you, start out on a, you can start out on a freemium model um, on our site. Uh, and so you're not a customer yet. Uh, then as you graduate up in, into a different subscription plan, you become a customer. Now it'll automatically um, do the payment through Zora, create a record in Zora, and then we use Intact, uh, which is another SaaS company for our financial system. Uh, the minute that I create a record in Zora, I need to simultaneously create a record in Intact because that's how we do our revenue recognition, and that's how we do all of our invoicing uh, at the end of the day. And so we have one IAP that that generates a flow off of an event. So the event is customer sign up or customer purchase that kicks off a series of, of events um, that create those records in Zora and Intact. Yeah, Madhukar. So Chris, this is Madhukar. I had a question. So, you know, a lot of our customers uh, ask us and that we wanted to understand from your experience. Typically, in order to set the whole cash to accounting flow, mm -hmm. using Mule Ion, how long does it take to integrate that based on your IAPs? Yeah, so uh, I think if we step to the next slide. So we have three IAPs. So we, we've broken it out into three pieces. Um, we actually also have it as a bundle, which I'll talk about. But um, the first thing we've done is we actually created a very nice REST API for integration into a commerce site. So. Uh, that basically lets you uh, take the Zora catalog and publish it into your website very quickly. And that, that now can be done by a JavaScript programmer or you know, a web programmer. You don't have to be a web services SOAP expert to, to do it. So that now is a, a couple days um, of development to, to configure that in. It depends on how much customization you want to do. Uh, then uh, then on the, the, the next piece would be the accounting piece. Um, uh, if you know what your uh, order to cash processes are, um, you can actually do this, again, out, out of the box as a template, so um, it depends how much you want to customize, but if you take the vanilla template, again, it, it can be a few-day exercise. 
Uh, and then hooking in the tax piece um, for those of you that need to calculate sales tax, um, you know, variety of sales tax uh, sort of scenarios out there, uh, whether it's telecom type tax uh, scenarios or just retail e-commerce type tax scenarios. Uh, we uh, today have um, an out-of-the-box solution with Avalara, who's another vendor in the tax space, uh, and that as well can be a couple days. So literally, if you wanted to do your entire order to cash, um, if you have a team on it, you know, get people that are dedicated to it, usually the long pull is working with the customer to make sure they understand their own business processes. But from a technology standpoint, this should be able to be done in a week or two. Yeah, this is very powerful because in my experience, I've seen customers trying to do that integration on their own and taking months to do that. So this is really very powerful. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the fundamental vision that we have around integration is, is we want to productize it. We want to make it more like a product experience and not a big systems integrator project. Um, you know, if you're going to use systems integrators, you should be using them to implement your SaaS applications and implement you know, best practice business processes, not spending time getting systems talking to each other. This is That's really the, the pain that we're trying to take out of, of um, moving to SaaS, uh, and we think it's, a, it's just a much better model. So uh, stepping into uh, pricing and packaging, um, so as I mentioned a little bit briefly, so, so we have a couple different uh, models uh, for ION. The first is we have a, an adoption model, which is a free account. So um, you can go to our website, and there's the green button in the corner. You can click on it and sign up for free. Uh, and you can use the product. You can develop, uh, test. Um, we give you one what we call a worker account. Uh, for free, um, and at the moment we don't really even have a time restriction on it. We want developers to use this. We think this is a much easier uh, way of, of getting going. Then the next step is if a developer actually builds something interesting, next slide, um, and they need to step up into uh, uh, a higher tier, we have uh, a variety of tiered models. And so these models uh, include things like uh, workers, which if you want high availability, you might configure multiple workers. You might decide to run them in different uh, zones of the country. Our, our, uh, our platform's all built on top of Amazon uh, Web Services, so we are uh, live on multiple availability zones across North America. Uh, and then with this comes uh, the number of events or transactions that go through the system, and you can add on more if you have a, a high volume type of uh, a website or a high volume type of trans, uh, a system, um, you can buy additional packages and things like that. So for us, it was really critical that we had a pricing engine that gave us that flexibility, and, and Zora definitely gives us more options than we're even using right now, but we expect to kind of grow into them. Um, so so the, the free model and this model really are targeted at our developer uh, users or systems integrators that want to actually get on this model and, and, and start building their own IaaS or custom integrations. And then the next slide, uh, we, we have uh, a series of, of more business-oriented packages. So as I mentioned with Zora, we've built a couple different IaaS uh, that we provide. So we have uh, a commerce to cash. Uh, this is actually a bundle. One of the We actually sell them individually and as a bundle um, and, and are able to, to uh, combine and split apart different packages. And we have other versions of these with other SaaS vendors as well. But um, just because of the Zora audience, uh, you know, here's one of the bundles. And so we have different editions. We have a very simple edition, which is quit with QuickBooks Online. Uh, and then as you move up into uh, the cloud and on-premise edition, there are different levels of complexity in dealing with different accounting systems, for example. So QuickBooks Online is, is pretty straightforward. The larger customers need more functionality, so we typically find them working with NetSuite or Intact. Um, did I lose the slide? Oh, there they are. Uh, and then obviously if you've got Oracle Financials or SAP, it's a, it's a bit of a different beast altogether, um, but we do support those. So sort of different tiers and different bundles. Um, if you go to the next one, we also have also the ability to add, ca add tax. So it's the same bundles and packages as before, but if you just want to add tax with a nice straightforward transparent pricing plan. 
so you know across across sort of the business innovation of the different models and the technology uh, innovation from open source enterprise to commercial enterprise to cloud and then the need to be able to create very different um, pricing and packaging plans for different users and different target markets um, yeah, I think these things all kind of go together and sort of a really important piece of technology that helps us do this yeah that's one of the things so th these all presenting all of these options is essentially giving each particular customer options that are going to be suitable for them. And so eventually that's going to reduce your churn, it's going to increase your customer loyalty, and, and you're really going to develop a, a relationship with that customer that's non-disposable. So if we, if we go on, so talking a little bit about, about Zora and who we are, um, we are the, the premier um, billing, finance, and commerce platform built for specifically for subscription-based businesses. And um, essentially, what our goal is to enable companies like MuleSoft to, to price and package exactly how they want and exactly how their customers want without the obstacles that come with traditional ERP systems or systems that just were never built for subscription. So I encourage you to check us out at Zora.com and, of course, MuleSoft at, at MuleSoft.com. So at, at this point, um, uh, I'd like to open it up to, to questions from the audience. And um, I've got a, a first one here. Um, this is a question, question for Chris. Chris, did, did the company ever uh, consider not going with a freemium model, or, or what were the benefits there? Yeah, uh, well, for, it depends on your business, I think. But for us, um, you know, the cloud is all about uh, lowering the barrier to access of, of technology. You, know, we're, it's, you, know, you hear the analysts talk about the consumerization of IT, the consumerization of software and things like that. So for us, we wanted to lower the barrier for people to try out the platform. And, and I think an additional consideration for us is we also have this, we, we have a free open source software model um, and we have you know, this very large developer community that uses that today and we wanted to invite all of them to move to the cloud. So part of it was strategic around our, our develop, existing developer community um, and moving them to the cloud with us. So a lot of these people will either work in big enterprise or they work in consulting firms and, and cloud integration will become a whole new opportunity for them. So for us it, was, it wasn't really a tough uh, choice to decide we wanted to do that. Uh, we don't have the incremental cost for us to allow for users is really, really small. So I mean, you need to look at that as well. I think that probably that might differ business to business. But uh, I think in the beginning, you, you want to make sure you have a very easy on-ramp uh, for people to try something. I mean, that, that in fact, that's kind of what SaaS is all about. And, you know, the old model of software was you, know, you pay a million dollars and we'll deliver you a toolkit and it'll take you six to 18 months before you get any value out of it. Um, that model's dead, in my opinion. I think open source software changed it where everybody could try things for free, and I think SaaS changes it because people can either try things for free or for very cheap. They use it right away, they get value right away, and then that justifies rolling it out in a much bigger purchase. So I think SaaS and open source actually have a very similar adoption model, uh, and a freemium model can actually be a very powerful uh, way to, to, uh, to approach that. And there's another one here, and I don't want to give away any company secrets of yours, but where do you see the next piece of innovation in this space going? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I mean, I think IAPs have a lot of room to go. I think there's you know, probably hundreds of thousands of, of IAPs to be built. Um, you know, We're working with uh, mid-sized SaaS companies. We're working with really big companies that are getting into um, publishing what they do as a service, uh, and there's all kinds of interesting opportunities around uh, creating new services quickly with ION, publishing those out on the web, making them very easy for both developers and other companies to consume. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, our next innovation in that area will, will lie in, in, in that general area of the market um, uh, because our technology enables that very quickly. Great. Well, with that, I um, want to uh, thank Chris and Matakar for, for joining me today on the event, and, um, and uh, thank everyone for, for joining and listening in. Take care. Bye-bye.